Okay. Looks like we are live. Um, I'm um, for those of us for you are in um, tuned in tonight. Um, welcome to this discussion on um, creation. This is part of the season of creation, um, a, a collaboration between uh, different uh, church uh, denominations within the, uh, South Africa. Um, my name is Rudolf Scharnik. I am the minister of the Dutch Reformed Church in uh, Ros um, Gardini in Rosenwald. And I'm joined here by Kuba Skirtsinger, who um, lives in Rosenville and who is um, very um, passionate about the environment and is involved in a lot of um, community projects concerning the environment. And uh, Kubus will share a bit on uh, his, uh, some of his projects, especially uh, practical advice on starting a community vegetable garden. So um, I'm, going, um, I'm going to uh, I'm ask Kubus to just introduce himself and just tell us a bit more um, about who he is. Thank you very much Kubus, welcome uh, with us this evening. Thank you Rudolf. Uh, I'm going to try and speak up, I'm trying to remember to speak up. Uh, I don't do this very often so this is uh, quite new to me so please excuse me if the little error slips in. So yes, uh, like Rudolf mentioned, I'm uh, Kubis, I've been involved with permaculture for um, the last 10 years. Um, I used to be a school teacher before that and really enjoyed the work, found it very um, satisfying and uh, I was settling down for a, a lovely career in a place called Omana, some of you might be from close to there. And uh, then I was introduced to uh, permaculture which is a movement that started in Australia in the late 70s uh, and it started because of um, the problem of uh, carbon fuels and carbon cost of uh, the carbon cost of the food that we eat and that we get from supermarkets and that's involved in the supply chain uh, at every level there's, uh, there's a carbon cost whether it's packaging, transport um, refrigeration, all of these things uh, require uh, a lot of energy and uh, in the end the food that we consume um, kilojoule for kilojoule is less energy than what we spend on producing and, and carting it around and that is the very definition of something that's unsustainable so uh, it's sustainable agriculture in that sense um, and the, the aim in permaculture is to grow as much food as we can, as close uh, as we can to home, to uh, communities, to uh, in between in houses, houses, in backyards, in communal areas, uh, and so forth. So, uh, I think the topic for tonight's discussion, uh, we just have to distinguish, first of all, between a communal garden and a community garden, because um, a lot of uh, people confuse the two. A communal garden is when a few friends get together and there's a piece of land or someone has a large backyard with an access to water and they share the land and they have a communal garden that they can all uh, take some share from, some of the harvest. Whereas a community garden is a completely different approach. In a community garden, there is uh, normally there's some um, uh, definite definitions of things like labor, where is the labor coming from, uh, where is the produce going, uh, it's not just a share amongst um, the people that work the land, but there's also uh, perhaps a soup kitchen or a community project of some sort that you support with your community garden. So first of all, I think it's important to, to frame it and say what are we trying to achieve with this garden. Um, and from the beginning, um, set out and, and we'll really get into the detail of it because otherwise I find that there's sometimes a lot of misunderstanding of roles and misunderstanding of um, who's actually doing the work, where's the food going, who's supplying what, who's supplying the electricity for the pump that brings the water and, uh, and all those issues. Um, I would say yes, first of all make that decision. Is it a communal garden? Is it a community garden? And then you start from there. Yes, Kubis, uh, I think that's very interesting, um, just as a start uh, for the discussion, because we are 
um, talking tonight about um, gardens um, in a community um, and we are actually um, thinking uh, about any type of uh, garden that people can share from um, gardens that are indeed close to home that you don't have to carry the produce and uh, transport it all the way from the supermarket or even from the farm to the supermarket and then to your house um, so I think um, that yeah if we can talk a bit about um, a communal garden where we would say I would like to start a uh, got such a project like say in my congregation um, some of many um, of the congregants might have a bit of um, a large yard um, and we would like to start and say listen we all um, one produce X and one produce Y and we share um, the excess crops we have um, among each other um, can you share a bit of insights um, around, around starting such a thing um, and what are the pitfalls uh, one should be looking out for? Mm. Yes, the pitfalls besides what I mentioned now, um, you know, just defining the roles carefully and, and seeing that someone doesn't feel they having to put in all the work, they having to walk over weekends and holidays, and someone else uh, is just enjoying the, the fruits of, of their labor. So I suppose that is, but let's not, let's not put on a black hat to start with. Let's just first look at the positives. Of course, this is music to my ears because this is the kind of um, thing that we should be we should be doing. Uh, a lot of discussions going on about um, uh, um, the environmental problems that we are heading for uh, in the near future, in our lifestyle lifetimes, and definitely that of our children. Um, there will be a complete rethink of where our food comes from, uh, what the quality of it is, um, and and how it is produced. So. Let's just start off and say it's a probably a very good idea to start something like this. Um, besides, uh, yes, then uh, there's a couple of different models one can follow. Um, the one would be to identify a large-ish piece of land. Uh, now, if you want to grow food for an average-sized family uh, to replace most of your vegetable needs, and perhaps some of your protein needs, like eggs, for example, that you can get from quail or chickens or ducks. Um, those things you can do in a, in a normal uh, size backyard of, um, you know, if you have a plot of about 800 to 1,000 square meters, um, there's a lot you can do if you have access to, to good water. Uh, partly uh, one of the big pitfalls and problems is that people start off and they think, Yes, let's go with it, and then they, they get the water bowl. So mm -hmm. if you're using municipal water, which is energy-intensive water, because you've, you've, you've had to use a lot of, of uh, energy to, to clean the water, um, not just the pumps that work through the stations, but also the, the chemicals that need to be produced and go into it. So treated water is, is um, difficult ground if you're going to start a garden. Um, if you're looking at using rainwater, collecting rainwater, then you would um, you would have to, uh, in the Western Cape, uh, I wouldn't think that that is a viable option for us because we have such a, a defined rain period, uh, wet period of the year. Um, and at the time when you can collect a lot of water, there is a lot of water, you don't need to water. And then once you start watering in the beginning of summer, which is more or less around now we need to start watering around here, um, you find that after one or two waterings, your tank is empty, and then you only get rain next time in winter. So rainwater tanks uh, are a good idea if you li live in a place where you get sporadic rainfall all through the year. Uh, there are places in the Eastern Cape where we have systems like that running, um, that you know, people can, can water from, from rainwater all year round. And if, they, if you have a, a, an average size house, you can collect a lot of rainwater off it. So, so do you consider water, first of all? You have to think of where you might find water for a large site. If you're looking at um, a thousand square meters or something that you, you want to start a communal garden where um, people are working together, uh, and the people that, that do the work also share the produce. So, yes, water is a big one. Um, then uh, safety, I suppose, is another. Uh, we live in South Africa and um, people are hungry. Um, and this is 
another reason why we need to start doing these things and also invite people in that might uh, have a bigger need than ourselves um, and encourage them to also start these kinds of things. But we, we'll get to those challenges later. Um, then um, easy access, and uh, because if it's one person's backyard, they might not want people coming there over a weekend. So, uh, you know, you have to think about when are people working in the garden? Are they working together? Have they got shifts? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated. Um, but once you thrash out all those details, it can be really rewarding. Um, you've mentioned it, but you have to work out a way that you're going to have a fair share of the produce that, that come. Because if you have a crop that fails, uh, or you, you're just getting into it, you're not that experienced, um, then um, you know sometimes there's very little that comes out of it in the beginning, and as you get more experience, a lot more will come. So it tends to, to work out that the people that are really have their hearts in it are the ones that stick around and continue to contribute, and the ones uh, to benefit in the end. Um, so yes, I would say if you have a piece of land about a thousand square meters, uh, if you can work on a, a sizable model like that, then um, you can grow the food for uh, about three households um, easily, most of their vegetable needs, and like I said, some protein needs as well. So that's kind of uh, the, the one model where you work together on one large piece of land. Um, the other model is uh, a lot more individualized, uh, where uh, you, you form a group, um, the group is defined, the members, uh, you become a member, it's not like anyone can just join at any time, uh, there are certain uh, set seasons that members join, and if you have, for example, eight members or ten members, you, um, you have uh, meeting, people come together, they say um, what their experience is, what their level of gardening has been before, what they've had success with in the past, um, and so forth, and what people can contribute to the group. And then you go back and you work um, in your own garden, but uh, you do it as a group. So if you're 10 people, you, for example, take 10 Saturdays um, and you decide this Saturday we're all working in Paul's garden. Next next Saturday we're all going to to, to uh, Christian's garden, and then we're going to Emma's garden. Um, and you do a blitz. We call it a blitz, uh, where you get a lot of work done, a lot of groundwork done, a lot of preparation of beds. Um, if you want to put in some water elements in the form of a pond uh, or a small dam. Um, and there's a lot of work required at the beginning of setting up such a garden. Um, then you have all your whole group there with you on a Saturday, uh, and everyone helps to uh, to set up a garden. And those go that guy gets going, and next Saturday he's in someone else's garden helping them to get going. So you have a lot of energy concentrated at the start. And you, you, you learn as you go. So you might think, well, it'd be nice if I build a straw that allows me to have my garden done first, because then I get going. But you see, by the time you get to the 8th and the ninth and the 10th garden, your whole group has a lot more experience. And they don't make the same mistakes that they did in the beginning. So it might not be such a bad idea to, to wait your turn. So that's one model that also works quite nicely. The other is to, to combine the two models, to say we have a, a larger area, which can be our teaching garden, we have sessions there when someone comes to demonstrate something, whether it's how to make a worm farm, uh, how to increase soil fertility, how to make compost, how to design beds, what to plant with what, whether it's companions, you can even take, uh, take turns and uh, one of your group presents on a certain topic that they've researched. Um, so that you also share the work ethic uh, that, that goes into research. Um, so those are, those are, are, are that's what I would suggest. Um, a big garden like that, you know, like I said, everyone has to define their role. It's a little bit easier uh, community-wise, speaking politically speaking, um, to do individual homes and individual houses. Um, 
because you're still king of your own castle uh, in a way you can you can put your design forward and people follow your design and it's your garden and perhaps that's a better way to start and then to say well look we've been working together as a group there's access to more land let's go and or we take um, shake hands with another community or um, uh, another group and we identify a land together that we can we can uh, start using so yes I, I told you i might go on and on no please if you, <laughs> if you need to interrupt me but those are the, the, the very practical things that i would um i would um consider um for your own home as well you need to think about where the water is coming from uh what's become very popular in the western cape during the drought of about three four years ago was the, the grey water systems where you can um a lot of the water that you use in your home you can repurpose for the garden you can clean it up using plants um, using a plant system a, a constructed wetland so if you want to turn to go and google that's it the constructed wetland there's uh, books written on it that you can you can easily uh, get your hands on in south africa um, how to design such a system and you take uh, water that is not very dirty dirty in this in this a form of soaps mm. and chemicals um, uh, and organic matter so th what you don't really want is organic matter in your water mm. so you want to not use your kitchen sink you want to obviously not use your toilet water that's it's illegal anyway um, and you want to uh, not use um, maybe the water from your basin where people tend to where there tend to be a high concentration of soap in the water uh, like shampoos and, and hand soaps and things whereas your shower water bath water and washing machine water all that is perfectly reusable uh, if you just treat it a little bit uh, and especially if you use um, less harsh harsh chemicals if you get more natural soaps um, that are better for your, your appliances anyway um, then and for your skin if you're using it uh, in a bath and shower then um, those things biodegrade and very very easily you can reuse that water so uh, we work on an average of about uh, 250 liters per person in a household of water per day so uh, that's it's shocking it's between 150 and 200 depending on how conscious you are about it um, so um, 150 liters times three people in a household gives you a, a, a nice amount of water for your garden already and that's summer and winter mm. yeah. Gareth, I think yeah, you are touching on an important um, subject what you're saying um, I think is very very interesting and just in terms of uh, um, yeah, thinking about starting such a project um, uh, but the matter of um, so you, you what you say is you can use your washing machine water and uh, bath water for your garden um, you don't have to use just once but it is better to just treat it before because i mean, would imagine like something like a, a this, um, soft um, fabric softener um, might be damaging um, or not good for the garden yeah so the, the, um, the big uh, so fabric softener by the way is one of the worst chemicals for uh, for microorganisms um, but your, your detergents in, the, in general that um, you know the, 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 the last thing you want going down into a system like that would be uh, bleach uh, uh, something like chip or chlor chlorine based things um, and uh, um, ammonia mm. these things in even low concentrations they tend to kill off a lot of the microorganisms that you depend on to break down the organic matter the stem cells the, the um, whatever else is in there so that's the one side of it the other big issue is the salts um, that are in those det detergents a lot of them are, are salt based so if for example uh, i've had many examples or many many instances of clients that say look the grass is very happy with our um our uh, washing machine water and we use just normal detergents and it's fine and i say well look it is fine for a while um, but the, the way that plants um, take up water is through osmosis and so it is need to move water is attracted to a place that's more saline that's more uh, salty basically than 
then uh, so if a plant, the, the way that a plant can can take up water through osmosis is to make its body, its roots, more saline than the soil around it, so that water then moves into the into the pores and into the plant. But if you um, salt up your soil, if you're continually putting down salts, then at one point there's a tipping point where uh, there's too much salt in the soil and the water, the plant can no more con compete with the salt in the soil and can no longer take up the water. And then you find yellow patches and it doesn't matter how much water you put after that then it's an issue. Now the saving grace in the Western Cape is that we do get all this rain mm -hmm. in winter. So what tends to happen then is we wash out a lot of those salts again. So by the next season when you start doing the same thing for your grass that's now looking dry, a lot of the salt has washed down into the um, subsoil and, and into aquifers and, and, and is gone. So that um, you know, your grass keeps going. Mm -hmm. But it is something to consider. Um, also, uh, yes, I would definitely treat uh, grey water. Um, number one, the soap and the fact that it is, has been heated through a geyser, for example, so heated water contains a lot less oxygen. So that um, so it, it becomes anaerobic very quickly. And anaerobic is where we get all the, the bad smells from, um, where the lock, lack of oxygen and the lack of, of good microorganisms that break down all the bad stuff and then all the things you want broken down before you reach the water. All the bacteria is basically um, suppressed yeah. by all those chemicals. And what happens is that you eventually um, end up with a very stinky mess because you know, there's no good bacteria doing a good job and breaking down all the, the unwanted things in the water. So these bacteria, um, bacteria tend to, microorganisms, uh, they live on the roots of plants. So you want to create a habitat for them. So if you look at the design of many of these grey water systems, you'll see that it's often a gravel bed of about um, 500 uh, millimetres to uh, 800 millimetres um, depth. Um, and water comes in the one end, it, it drains out the other end, but inside that gravel you put specific plants that are hosts for those microorganisms that will break down the chemicals um, and make the water usable uh, again. So, yeah, so I think water is obviously then one very important thing, as you've um, said uh, multiple times now, um, in terms of this whole idea of whenever you want to start a um, vegetable garden, um, for the community or for yourself even, uh, water is a major concern. But um, also I think the quality of soil might um, should also play a role. Um, and how would you say uh, what would be a good idea to treat the soil and to increase the quality of the soil? Um, when you're looking at something like a community garden or a communal garden um, where people work together, can uh, is it feasible to start uh, like a communal compost um, system as well? Um, yes, I... I agree. Uh, I mean, the quicker you can bring about uh, soil fertility and soil life, the better your results are going to be and your yields are going to be. So, yes, you should, from the outset, look at ways to uh, improve the soil. Uh, typically, uh, from, a, from an environmental perspective, we don't like to go into virgin soils, uh, basically soils that have been bushed before and that has been uh, a working ecosystem for centuries and to go and, and uh, basically flatten that out and, and destroy all the, the good bacteria and fungi and um, all the good microorganisms and elements and everything that's holding that soil, that's being held in that soil to basically kill the soil and then start the garden or start farming. Unfortunately, uh, for a while now, that's the way that industrial agriculture has worked there's some major changes now. Um, there's pressure from um, from uh, um, consumers, but also farmers tend to be people that kind of love the land, and they've also started seeing the effects of continuous chemical spraying, pesticide spraying, uh, herbicide spraying. So they say they they also start to see. Look, wait, um, I've got to leave something for my pigs mm. on this farm. Um, so, uh, to get back to your point, 
there's lots of ways that one can one can bring about fertility in soil. And I mean, at the outset of such a project, if you really want to spend the money on it, you can go and do a soil test, send it away to Dem Lab, or to shouldn't be mentioning names, but there's a few labs that just uh, if you just Google soil tests, um, that you can you can send your samples, and they have a little instruction uh, list of instructions about how you extract the soil samples and how you should get it to them, and you can do that. Um, and then they typically will give you advice. If you say, I want to grow vegetables or I want to grow fruit trees, they will give you the amendment, a list of amendments that you need to, to apply to the soil. So th these things like if there's a magnesium deficiency or a calcium deficiency of some sort, then they will, they will tell you, like, if you want to grow this crop or that crop or vegetables in general or a tree crop, then you need to do these amendments. So... That's one way to go about it. Um, what I prefer, and if you even if you just don't, you just want to start. You don't want to complicate things for yourself at the moment. You just want to get this thing off the ground and see how it goes. Let it grow organically with with how people are um, gaining experience and, and learning from mistakes and learning from a, a, a pest. Why is that pest there? Uh, why are my, are my plants uh, not healthy? Um, so the um, the idea would be to put um, put as much organic matter into the soil as possible. So whether you're starting off with clay soil, whether it's sandy soil, there's no harm that can be done by putting organic matter into the soil because organic matter is what soil organisms live on mm. um, and they are the ones that break it down break down the carbon um, and other elements and pass it along to your plants so uh, you need an organic matter in the soil so there should be someone with a, a horse farm close by that has straw with nice manure mixed into it um, that is one very good source of organic matter. Like you were saying, compost. Compost is a very special thing. Um, and I mean, it takes care of all that food waste that we have as well. So if you can collect and, and compost food waste, there's a lot of nitrogen in there. So you can even mix it up with straw, a heavy carbon material, and, and that will break down quite nicely into a compost. You can make hot compost. You can do a, go to a lot of trouble. Um, Compost can be a lot of hard work, but you get a very good result. Um, the other thing is to, uh, if you want to go about it in a little bit more easy way, is to um, perhaps start something like a worm farm, where you can create a bacterial and micro a micro uh, organism culture that um, that you can then multiply um, by just by limiting some oxygen if you've uh, if you've diluted it with water. Um, and and then applying that culture to whatever organic matter you've laid down. And this can be something as simple as wheat that has been slashed. Mm. So um, often when you start off with an empty piece of land, um, you'll find that there's a lot of wheat growing there, maybe hupai uh, weeds. And the, probably the best thing you can do about that is to slash it, lay it down, so it forms that layer of organic matter over the soil, um, and then spread a good bacterial culture into it through a compost tea or a worm tea, a good worm tea, tea with a high bacterial count, um, and let that start the process of breaking down. Because these things, like we all know, bac bacteria um, enumerate through mitosis, so they basically, when conditions are good, they split up and they can exponentially uh, increase their numbers. So um, you just have to not interfere too much. Mm. Um, so a lot of our gardens, when we start out with a, a natural way of gardening, a lot of our gardens look like, look a bit rough. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so to us it seems like chaos. And for a while there it is a bit of chaos because you've got weeds that are from different parts of the world, you've got um, um, microorganisms, you've got insects, you've got so many things that are trying to find a niche there that's going to try and start um, you know, uh, 
seeking out a living for itself there and then for them to all find their balance um, takes takes a while um, and then once you've got the fertility going then it's very easy to say okay now guys our aim is after three years we want this to be nice and tidy we want to invite fruits in and we can tidy it up as much as we want as long as we realize that the tidying up is the work and not the production mm -hmm. because a garden nature isn't very interested in tidiness and little lines and little passes we do that to make it more accessible for ourselves but really it will be productive without you having to plant things in a row and do little one 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 plants and for example um, some of my clients have had issues now with the with the um, I mean, this is the time of year that we have a lot of snails. So they plant their cabbage seedlings, um, they plant them up in the garden and they get there the next morning and it's just a little stem uh, or half the leaves are gone uh, or so forth. And then you look at nature's way, how does it, how do, how do plants stop this from, from happening or how do they defend themselves? And first of all, uh, in nature nothing sows itself one by one by one in you know spaced so far mm. apart um, it doesn't work that way in nature it sows itself in the millions um, and then mm. when the snails come the first night they take away maybe half and the next night they come and they take another half and you end up with a few strong seedlings the ones that have been able to survive to the survival of the fittest you didn't try and nurse a little one seedling that has lost its one leaf and so in, in the end, you have your strong plants that can defend themselves against insects even um, chemicals. But if they go, go in healthy soil, they can produce their, those chemicals in their leaves. They can uh, put out chemical uh, scents for insects when they're under attack from another insect to come and zap that way. So there's, um, plants can do amazing things. They've had to adjust because they can't move around. So they, they have to be able to, to find what they need right where they are and to use the things that they have within their grasp. So, um, um, yeah, I, 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 um, you get animal people and plant people. I'm very much a plant mm -hmm. person because I think they, they, they're very clever. Um, so, yes, uh, fertility is very, very important. Um, and it comes about naturally. Nature has its own way of building fertility and, um, and, and, and doing succession. So a lot of the time when you, um, when you see degraded soil, the first thing that you will see are, are the bad weeds, the tough weeds, the tough guys, the devil thorns, the snake apples, the, um, the stinging nettles. Um, the, the thistles with the very spiky leaves and flowers and those things that, that generally are not easy for animals to eat uh, and that can, can defend themselves. They, they have strategies, amazing strategies. If you look at uh, one kind of devil thorn that spreads itself from a central root, a very strong taproot that goes straight down and it spreads itself out right on the ground. Um, it doesn't need to use energy to make its stem strong to stand up. It can just lie flat on the ground and it can go as far as it can go and it can collect water through its leaves and through that deep tap root. And once it dies as, a as, a, as an annual, it leaves that organic matter in the form of its root, that deep tap root um, in the soil. And it creates the little channel, it creates um, a channel for air and for water to get down as this rock down puts the organic matter in the soil and it makes conditions just that little bit better for the next generation of plants and then the next species of plants that move in and the next and the next and the next and before you know it not before you know it over, over <laughs> some years you will um, you will reach apex so that system can reach apex again uh, because the more organic matter there is the more um, leaf matter, the more roots in the soil, the more water is being held in that soil and on top of that soil and in that environment. And the more water that's being held, uh, the more 
the growth can occur again. So you get this, this positive cycle. Um, and if you're going to start understanding that, and you can exploit it, not exploit it, you can, you can work with nature to speed along this process by slashing and laying down, um, by bringing in some wood chips, by chipping up logs, so to speed along the, the process of breaking down, create surfaces for microorganisms to attach themselves to um, and do the job more quickly. So there's definite ways and, uh, and strategies and methods that you can employ to, um, to get your, uh, your soil more fertile very quickly. Um, yeah, Gomez, yeah, I think um, yeah, this has really been an interesting discussion. I think we could actually go on for uh, much longer, but I think well, um, as I hear you correctly, I think the first thing one, when you want to start a community garden or any type of garden for that matter, but is looking at your water supply um, and try to get that right. And w once you are established on a good water supply and know where you're going to get your water from, then you can start uh, looking at the soil and um, yeah, and get a group together. And I think um, it's an easy, um, uh, as a faith communities, I think we've all got access to lots of groups of people um, and many of them have space uh, in their gardens or um, in the backyard where they can start a garden and then they can share. But I think you've helped us now a lot um, on uh, starting to think of doing this. Uh, and to me, it was really revelatory um, and, uh, on a lot of levels uh, on what can be done and um, how one should go about. And I think well, our time is running a bit out now, but I think we could, we could still um, go on for a long time discussing this because it is very interesting. But um, I think we've, um, is, um, they, we've covered a lot of interesting topics on this matter. So, well, I don't think if is there anything else, uh, maybe just to sum up, um, say we want to start a community garden, uh, we are a few friends or a few congregants who would like to start such a um, garden, or I'm the minister of the church and I want to get a few um, congregants together and we start a, um, a, such a project. Uh, where would you say, um, should I start? Uh, or maybe just um, give us uh, a few thoughts uh, to close down. I think it comes about with an understanding um, and perhaps a lifestyle change in the sense of not uh, of slowing down. So, and at one stage when I discovered this this idea that our food is costing the earth, uh, perhaps we can afford it in money to buy nice produce from a store. Um, perhaps we can afford uh, even to waste some of that food, but the earth cannot afford us to waste it. It, it cannot afford that amount of waste. It cannot afford that amount of energy that we're using to produce waste um, all along this uh, supply chain. So I think, first of all, it would be, and this is where... Um, your beliefs really also come to um, for me personally. This is where this is my physical contribution um, to what I believe is good for the earth, good for other fellow human beings, um, good for communities. Um, that we we start turning things around because not only. Uh, are we tackling some of those major issues that we're facing in the future? But it's fun and it's good and it's healthy. Our children, we learn to eat healthy food. You have a healthy body um, that houses a healthy mind um, and, and you get creative. I think it's really important that, that people start to organize and, and just start a little, even if it's just in a pot on your, uh, your balcony. Um, just start and, and think about where your food is coming from. Why does it need to be in so much plastic packaging? Um, how can we how can we save on that? How can we save? How can we get our bins to a state where there's nothing to put out for the for the bin man or for the truck um, at the end of the week? Because um, all my garden scraps, my kitchen scraps, my vegetable peels, my uh, fruit um, waste. That's all gone to the chickens or to the worm farm. Um, 
my plastic and, and bottles that I'd use, that's all going into the recycling. Um, and uh, it, it, in, in the end, there's really nothing to go in the bin. Uh, and if we can start thinking about zero waste and how we can um, do the same with our water, how can we not just send the water that, a, 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 a lot of water that we've just put a little bit of detergent, just to use that once to run over your body just so you can feel nice and warm and be a little cleaner at the end of it. How can we reuse that water and really get it to do the work? Um, where how can we limit that waste as well? Mm. How can we limit the, um, the waste of electricity um, in our homes? Um, I mean, these, these are things that our previous generations, our grandparents, kind of you know, put the, turn off the lights when you leave the room and all these kind of things. They, they were doing it because these things were expensive. Um, it's become rather cheap um, mm. to the extent that you know we don't really think about where our food comes from. They put free crops, it's okay. Um, but we're not paying the true cost. Uh, we, we're still taking, we're just paying the extraction cost. We're not really paying the true cost. So yeah, I'd say start thinking about these things really. Uh, you know, get, get a garden club, a garden group together. And even if someone has no land, there will be an area where they can put their, their effort into. Um, you know, one person might not have the time, uh, but they have the land. So how can how can we work together so that the land gets uh, worked and gets gets to a stage where it's productive, uh, and both can enjoy um, the fruits of it. So yeah, mm. this is a kind of a just get going. Thank you very much, Gubas. I think this has been a, v a very interesting discussion, and I think. He said some stuff that we really need to think about. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I really um, I hope to, I will definitely get you to um, get do some more talks because I think the church needs to hear more about this. So thank you very much for your um, time and your effort um, talking to us this evening. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.